This is the Youth Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, day 92. Today's devotion is about God's call on our lives to aim high. But what does it mean for a Christian to aim for perfection? And there's a big difference between aiming for perfection and being a perfectionist. But when God calls us to be perfect, to aim for perfection, he doesn't mean we need to be flawless. He just means that he wants us to strive towards the wonderful future he promises us in Jesus. A future filled with joy, love, and the Holy Spirit. So how do we aim for perfection while steering away from the dangers of perfectionism? The Chelsea Flower Show may well be the most famous flower show in the world. It attracts visitors from all continents. There are four grades of award presented. Gold, silver gilt, silver, and bronze. As well as awards for gardens and flowers, the Knightian Award is for exhibits of vegetables. I once had a man being interviewed about the fact that he was retiring after winning the gold medal for his vegetables for 10 years in a row. Asked for the secret of his success, he said, I aim for perfection, but I settle for excellence. Aim for perfection, writes the Apostle Paul. This is very different from perfectionism. Perfectionism is a personality trait characterized by striving for flawlessness. It leads to setting excessively high performance standards. Perfectionists are overly critical of themselves and constantly concerned about what others think of them. It leads to a fear of failure and making mistakes. It can lead to depression, anxiety and missed opportunities. God's people have always been called to aim high while avoiding the dangers of perfectionism. God gave to his people in the Old Testament a wonderful vision of their potential inheritance. It's all yours in Christ Jesus. From Proverbs 8 The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works, before his deeds of old. I was formed long ages ago, at the very beginning, when the world came to be. I was there when he set the heavens in place, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was constantly at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in the human race. Aim to be full of joy. Jesus wants you to be full of joy. He wants you to experience complete joy. He said, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. The description of personified wisdom in today's passage is echoed in the way the New Testament talks about Jesus. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Wisdom is seen to be full of joy. Day after day I was there with my joyful applause, always enjoying his company, delighted with the world of things and creatures, happily celebrating the human family. This joy is overflowing, filled with delight. It's constant day after day. Where does this joy come from? First, it comes from God's presence, in his presence. Second, it comes from relationships with other people, the human family. Third, it comes from God's creation, world of things and creatures. God has given us all good things richly to enjoy. It is all yours in Christ Jesus. The joy that Jesus experienced in his relationship with God the Father strengthened him in his life on earth. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Jesus teaches us to aim high with our own lives, never just making do, but enduring hardships and always seeking the joy of God's presence. Lord, thank you that you want your joy to be in me and my joy to be complete. May I never settle for anything less. New Testament from Luke 9 When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. 
They answered, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Aim to be full of love. Jesus is the supreme example of love. Even the secular world often recognizes this. Time magazine said this, Jesus, the most persistent symbol of purity, selflessness and love in the history of Western humanity. Jesus loves you. He cares about your physical needs. Rather than sending the crowd away hungry, to find food for themselves, he gets his disciples to feed them miraculously. We come back again to the feeding of the 5,000, the only miracle apart from the resurrection recorded in all four Gospels. We are reminded of how much Jesus can do with the very little that we offer him and of the fact that Jesus involves us in his miracles. This is a huge privilege and it's all yours in and through Jesus. The disciples begin to understand who Jesus really is when he asks, Who do you say I am? And Peter answers, The Christ of God. Jesus begins to explain to them about his death, the greatest act of love in history, and resurrection. He challenges his disciples to aim high. He calls you to aim at three things which together comprise love for others and love for Jesus. First, no sin. Sin is the opposite of love. In the middle of the word sin is the letter I. Jesus says, Whoever would come after me must deny themselves. God may ask you to make different sacrifices in your life, but the only thing we are all required to give up is sin. Every day the challenge of love requires little acts of self-denial. Second, no self. Jesus says, Those who would come after me must take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose them, but those who lose their lives for me will save them. Effectively, Jesus invites us to come and die. The cross today is a symbol of hope. However, then it was a symbol of pain, shame, disgrace, and ultimately death. Jesus said that if you live a life of selfish ambition, even if you're the most successful person of all time and gain the whole world, it will do you no good at all. The way to find life in all its fullness is to abandon your life to the love of Jesus and of others. Take up your cross daily and follow him. Being willing to give up your life is the ultimate act of love. This is the example that Jesus set first. He calls you and me to follow his example. Cleave steadfastly to me. Conform wholly to my example in living and if need be, in dying. Third, no secrecy. Jesus says, All who are ashamed of me And my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. If you love Jesus, don't be ashamed of him. Sometimes even taking his name on our lips is a challenge. Don't be ashamed of his teaching, his words. If you want Jesus to be proud of you, you must be proud of him. If you love people, you will want everyone to know about Jesus. Speaking for myself, I know how often I fall short in these areas, but the fact that our lives fall very far short of perfection should not stop us aiming high. Lord, help me to aim high. Help me today to deny myself, take up my cross and follow you. May I never be ashamed of you or your words, but rather boldly declare the good news of your death and resurrection for us. Old Testament from Numbers 33-34 to 
Take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess. The Lord said to Moses, These are the names of the men who are to assign the land for you as an inheritance, Eleazar the priest and Joshua son of Nun, and appoint one leader from each tribe to help assign the land. Aim to be full of the Spirit. You have an amazing inheritance. It's all yours in Jesus. This passage describes the inheritance that God assigned to his people. Although they set out boldly, they'd wandered around in the desert for 40 years. They never fully enjoyed their inheritance. Paul, preaching in the book of Acts, explains that God gave the land to his people as their inheritance. He goes on, we tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. This is now your inheritance. God's promise to give his people the land of Canaan was always about more than simply good real estate. It was a promise of flourishing as God's people enjoyed relationship with God under the security of God's protection in God's promised place. This points forward to the New Testament concept of the kingdom of God, the sphere of God's presence and rule. It is this that is fulfilled in Jesus and it is yours now. In Christ. Your inheritance is the promised eternal inheritance. It's an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. Not only do you have this inheritance to look forward to in the future, but you can experience something of this inheritance right now. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The Greek word for deposit, arabon, is a word that means down payment. In other words, you experience here and now a foretaste of that inheritance through the Holy Spirit. As you live in the Spirit, your life will be changed to produce the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Don't settle for second best. Aim to be full of the Holy Spirit. Receive your inheritance. Lord, help us in the Spirit to be ruthless with sin so that we do not allow anything to become barbs in our eyes and thorns in our sides. Help me to aim high, to receive my inheritance and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Pepper adds, In Luke 9 verse 12, it says that the disciples said to Jesus, Send the crowds away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside to find food and lodgings. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. It has been a hard few years, a global pandemic, followed by war in Ukraine. I don't feel I have much to give to anyone from my spiritual and emotional tank. But I love how Jesus uses the disciples to provide for everyone, even without them realizing what was happening. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you make me perfect through your sacrifice on the cross. Help me today to strive for perfection, but not fall into the danger of perfectionism. Fill me up today. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.